getting around to now. And Christmas Eve is at 6 p.m. on the 24th, and Christmas Day service is at 10.15. Birthdays this week, and I'm not telling your age, I want you to know that. Melissa Anstein, Laura Whitmer, Sally Kaltrider, Joanna Bortner, Felicia R. Phillips, and uh, that's about it. And now, um, let's start with our lighting of the Advent candle. Miss Rita, if you would come forward. And while she's coming forward, I'm going to take a minute to get a light of the light off the altar candles. Today, we light four Advent candles. The first candle we light reminds us to have hope, not just so that our plans might come true, but to believe that God has a way for us that we might not even see. We light the second candle for peace, the courage to live the love of Christ, not just in words, but in deeds. We light the third candle for the joy that God gives us, knowing that God is at the center of our life. The heart 
heart of Christ is love. And now for our call to worship. People who have often frame our situation for us, they only allow us to focus on certain aspects of reality without seeing the whole. Stepping back and examining our point of view and our assumptions allows us to see the real situation and the big picture. God also reframes our faith by bringing his son to birth in Bethlehem as a peasant child Seeing God as such a little one opens our eyes to see that we too can be vulnerable, that the Lord is with us in our struggles, and we need to help others with their challenges. Let us gather and worship the Lord who is with us.
You may be seated. Let us come before the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, it is mighty gloomy out there today, it overcast skies, and certainly the cold wind is built, b- blowing if, if we should think it's just way too hot like it was yesterday, the day before. But you, Lord, are our warmth. In the midst of this cold season, when everything looks grim, you are there with hope and potential and possibility. In this season when often people can be grumpy and Ebenezer Scrooge-like, your love, Lord, warms our hearts and helps us to be a warming and kind influence to others. We ask, Lord, that you bless us today, for we are blessed to have the children do a wonderful program in which they tell the stories of faith, in which they remember what our faith is all about. And we know you're going to be with them in their program today and help them. It's a crazy time, Lord, because we are, of course, in the middle of this pandemic, and it's, it's getting nasty again, and more people are getting sick, and hospitals are getting more crowded. We pray that you will help us to do our best to help others and keep them safe and secure. Bless us as a congregation, bless our faith, and help it to warm the snows of this cold world. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, your offering can be mailed to Cindy Forbes at 5123 Sinshine School Road, Spring Grove, PA 17362. Your Sunday school offerings can be sent to Neil Rohrbaugh at 800 Mengus Mills Road, Spring Grove, PA 17362. Or there's two offering plates in the back of the church, one for Sunday school and one for the church. You're more than welcome to leave them there. And there's some offering envelopes on the left side too. Oh, your, your right side, my left side, you know how it is. Lord, as we see the Christmas tree in church, we're reminded of the gifts that are soon going to appear underneath all our Christmas trees, and sometimes the worries about all of that. But we remember that at Christmas you have given us your son, and it is a wonderful present, for his spirit is always in our hearts and keeps giving. May we take that generosity and care about the faith and well-being and the health of others, May we take that love and make it work in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to tell you a story today about two sisters, Marley and Janie. They're just just little girls. And one day, it's summer, they're playing out in the backyard of their parents' home. It's a nice fenced-in backyard. Mom can watch from the kitchen window while she's doing some chores, making sure everything's okay when suddenly Marley, the younger one, comes in crying. And mom says, what's the matter? Janie crushed my doll. She crushed her to death. She was once formed and now she's just just like paper flat as a pancake. She did it on purpose. She wanted to kill my doll. Do you think so, said her mom. Yes, that's what. So soon enough, Janie comes inside and says, "Uh, Janie, can you tell me what happened to uh, Marley's doll? I didn't kill her doll. I didn't do that. I was just jumping, and she happened to be under my feet. Hmm. Notice the change in frame of reference. She goes from doll murderer to one who was just jumping, and the doll was there. Mom gets suspicious. She decides to go outside and investigate. 
the scene of the crime, if you will. There is a big rock in the backyard and the girls just love to play on it and they love to jump off of it. And uh, mom says, was your doll, Marley, by chance lying in the grass? Yeah, but Janie jumped on it. Would you have been able to see your doll in the grass? Maybe not, she said. Do you think she did it on purpose? Well, well I'm sure she, well, I don't know, she said. Sometimes accidents happen, it's, it's okay. Now, did you see how that frame of reference kept changing during the story? from murderer of dolls to someone who's trying to make a lame excuse to someone who has just happened to accidentally step on the doll. Sometimes if we change our frame of reference, move the camera to another position, take a different point of view, we see things entirely differently. For example, let's take Christmas. Christmas is often thought of as a time when people give gifts, right? And everybody certainly is looking for special gifts under the tree. They're really looking for that. And so we tend to think of that, like maybe, what am I going to get? But as you grow up, it's more, what am I going to get him or her? I have no idea. And, you know, you, you try to beg your relatives to tell you what you want, they want for Christmas. Santa may not show up if you don't have, haven't told them what he want, what you want. And... They don't listen to you and you get so annoyed and you go out and buy something and you're thinking, is this the thing they want? Because I can't really find hardly anything out there. The stores aren't stocked like they were. And, and, and what do you do, right? Are they going to like it? Are they not going to like it? And it's all this worry that goes into Christmas. Besides which, I remember at least as a kid looking over those mail order catalogs when they used to have them and thinking, oh, I want this and I want that for Christmas. And you get a case of the greeds, you know, it's just not, not a good feeling. But what if Christmas was different? I would take a different bird's eye view at the Christmas holiday. Maybe reading They're the doing story. A children's program this morning. We read that from Luke chapter eight, Luke chapter two, verses one through seven. In those days, Caesar Augustus ordered yeah. a tax to and be taken. And this census was taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And each went to his own hometown. And Joseph traveled from yeah, Nazareth and Galilee. I'll get it yet. Nazareth and Galilee to Bethlehem in Judea because he was of the house and lineage of David. He was one of his relatives. And Mary went with him, who was betrothed in marriage to him. And when they got there, the time for her baby arrived. She gave birth to her son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger because there was no room in an inn. Notice in the story, no Christmas tree, no gifts. Well, there's the wise men, but they come later. And uh, none of the usual things we associate with Christmas. It's about... God giving us his son. God loves us and decides to come in a form we can recognize and care about us. But more than that, more than anything, God comes as a vulnerable little baby. Isn't that amazing? A vulnerable little baby. Now, why would God do that? You see, anyone from ancient times hearing this story would say, oh, th there's got to be something wrong here because Babies, sons of kings, were not born in mangers. They weren't born in a peasant home. They weren't born in a stable. They were born in the midst of a palace. And that palace was a glorious place, surrounded only by the palaces and mansions of the elite in the center of the city around a very large protective wall that was guarded by armed troops all the time. And you were not vulnerable if you were a king's son born in ancient times in a palace. It just wasn't happening. But a little baby, God's son, born out in the cold, that didn't seem right. And I mean, not with the honors and respect and dignity. You know, I mean, anybody could show up at the stable, right? Whereas for God's son, for a normal king's son, you didn't go and that part of the city if you were a peasant you weren't allowed unless you were working or delivering something and here Jesus is open to everybody 
Why is God born so vulnerable like that? And especially when you think of Joseph and Mary, these are hardworking people who take care of themselves. They take care of others. They have love and compassion, and they are righteous and caring. And suddenly they're thrown into a situation where everything starts to fall apart. You know, like those vacations you've been on that you planned everything down to the T, and then all of a sudden everything is just crazy. First of all, Caesar orders this census to be taken. They have to go trudging 70 miles from Nazareth down to Bethlehem to be registered in the census. All kinds of people are having to move around like this. And that doesn't make much sense. And then soon we hear that they're getting worried about Herod maybe coming to kill the child. This does not seem like a good uh, vacation planner to me. It's, it's really everything falling apart. Why are these really competent, caring, righteous people put in a situation of being that vulnerable? Because all of us in our lives have times when we're vulnerable, as caring and good and hardworking as we might be. And God is there for us. God beat us to the punch. God is already there and cares so much about us. It's like if you've ever talked to somebody when you've gone through a difficulty, maybe you were sick and they start telling you, I know what you mean. I was just through that same illness not long ago. And did you feel this way? Did you feel that? Oh yes, I felt exactly that way. God's been there and knows. And so when we're at the end of our rope, when all the doors seem to be slammed shut, when nothing seems to be positive, we know that not only is God there, but God has a plan, just as he does for Mary and Joseph. And what's so really neat about Mary and Joseph is that they are people who have such deep faith and trust in God. Mary gets, to gets told by an angel, you're going to have this new baby, this son of God. Okay, fine with me. Joseph hears this strange tale about his betrothed being pregnant, conceived by the Holy Spirit. Eh? And angel says, it's okay. And he's okay. These are people of deep faith. They are showing us how to trust in God. Second, God born as a vulnerable baby teaches us how to be compassionate. Have you ever been sleeping around two in the morning and a baby starts to cry? And what does that do for you? Doesn't it just rattle your central nervous system? Doesn't that crying just say, get up and do something. I want to go to sleep. I've got a busy day tomorrow. I've got so much to do. Get up and take care of the baby. And the, you know, you're trying to get the formula heated. I know you don't heat formula anymore, but in our day you did. And uh, the baby still keeps crying. Say, like, look, kid, I'm trying my best. Help me out here. And, and they still keep crying, right? And it wakens compassion in you. I, I'm sure you've seen movie news, uh, footage sometimes about people starving in some foreign country. And if it's adults, we say, oh, kind of too bad. But hey, see a little baby all emaciated and it just breaks your heart. You want to reach in and get some money out and try to help them some way. It awakens their compassion. It awakens our compassion. There's something else God coming as a little baby does for us. And it helps us to teach children about life. Now, parents who are responsible and caring teach children all kinds of skills. They teach them their ABCs. They might teach them how to read. They might teach them how to ride a bicycle. As they get older, they, they talk to them about life situations and how complicated they are and help them to work through it. They teach them everything they can so that that child will be able to take care of themselves and others. They'll be able to earn a living. They'll be going into the world and be very, very competent to avoid and deal with as many disasters as possible. But still, some things happen that can be disastrous. And children need to know how to deal with the fact that sometimes we can fail. Sometimes our plans don't work out. Sometimes people aren't as helpful or as nice as they can be. Because otherwise, when those things happen, they seem to fall apart. And that's what the story of Christmas is all about for them. And today, 
our children are going to share with us some of the stories of Christmas through, and the, and the Old Testament as well, through a story about the Jesse tree. And don't we take our hats off to those parents who have really tried to bring them to Sunday school and help them to learn what faith is about and help them to cope with situations that might come upon them. Not only to be prepared and to be competent and caring and loving, but also to know that God is with us no matter what, because God was once that baby, God was once that vulnerable, and God is showing us the way. And now, after the children show up, they're in the back waiting for us, waiting for the pastor to get down the long sermon, and they're going to be all coming up and getting into position. So uh, for those of you at home, there might be some pauses in the program today. So don't don't think we've disconnected you. Uh, They're all just getting ready to come. And I would invite the children to come now, now, yes so that we can be ready for them. looking at pictures from Christmas past. I do so like to reflect on my past and my ancestors. It's fun to look at my roots. Do you know about your roots? Like roots from a tree in the ground? Well, not like a real tree, but your family tree, yes. Just like the roots in a real tree give it nourishment and a strong foundation. Your ancestors, the people who are your roots, can be your foundation. Are you a root grandpa? Thank you. Well, I suppose I am. I like to look at pictures in our scrapbooks too. see when I was a baby. So say baby Jesus. Hey grandpa, what you doing? 
Did baby Jesus have roots? He most certainly did. We didn't have photographs of his family album, but there are stories about all of his ancestors in the Bible. The Bible is kind of Jesus is like is kind of like Jesus' scrapbook. Without the pictures, though. Yes, without the pictures, but the stories are so amazing that when you hear them, you can imagine the pictures in your mind. Tell us a story, Grandpa. Yes, tell us. Please. You children remind me of when I was a little boy. I used to want my mother to tell me stories from the past too. She had this one tradition every Christmas. She would tell me a story about Jesus' family tree. Each time she hung up an ornament on our Christmas tree, I remember it like it was yesterday. My mother called our tree the Jesse tree. Before she would begin decorating, she would read from the book of Isaiah in the Bible. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. His root from a branch will bear much fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and the and of power, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the Lord forever. This comes from the book of Isaiah. Then she would carefully open the ornament box and wrap each decoration with such gentleness and love. The first one was an apple to symbolize Adam and Eve. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed, and the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the, tree, were the trees of life, and the trees of knowledge of good and evil. This comes from the book of Genesis. Next was a rainbow. I bet you know who that represents. <coughs> Noah! That's right. I love the rainbow ornament, mostly because I love rainbows and how they symbolize God's love and promise for the world. And God said, this is a sign of the covenant I'm making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I, remember my, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. This comes from the book of Genesis. Then there was an ornament that looked like an altar. It reminded us of the story of Abraham and the beginning of his re relationship with God. <laughs> The Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and I and you will be a blessing. To your offspring, I will give, the, give this land. So Abram built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. This comes from the book of Genesis. Let's see, then there was a colorful coat. Was that for Joseph and his coat of many colors? Yes, indeed. Next to the rainbow was my favorite. They both were so colorful and pretty. <clears throat> Sorry. 
Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his, by his brothers, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his older sons because he had been born to him in old age and he made him a richly ornamented robe for him. This comes from the book of Genesis. Then I remember this gray clay ornament that looked like the tablets of 10 commandments. Moses also came before Jesus. He tried to help the people follow God's ways, God's commandments. Moses summoned all Israel and said, Hear, O Israel, the decrees and laws I declare in your hearing today. Learn them and be sure to follow them. The Lord our God made covenant with us. These are the commandments the Lord proclaimed in a loud voice to your whole assembly there on the mountain. From out of the fire, the cloud, and the deep darkness, and he added nothing more. Then he wrote them on two stone tablets and gave them to me. This comes from Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. I also love the next ornament my mother got out. It was a beautiful gold harp to symbolize King David. You know, Bethlehem is the city of David. Jesus was born in the city of his ancestor, David. So Saul said to his attendants, find someone who plays well and bring him to me. One of the servants answered, I have sent the son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the harp. He is a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is a fine looking man and the Lord is with him. This comes from the book of Samuel. What came next, Grandpa? Well, I believe next came the story of Jesus' own parents and his relative, Elizabeth. Yes, there was a cradle to remind us of Mary, the mother of Jesus. The angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Holy of the Most High will overshadow you. Go, go, said the Holy One to be born, will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in old age. And she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May, may it be to, to me as you have said. This comes from the book of Luke. Then I always liked the next ornament. It was a small house to represent Elizabeth. Mary went to visit her when she was pregnant with baby Jesus. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her room, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. This comes from the book of Luke. A hammer was the next was the ornament that represented Jesus' early father, Joseph the carpenter. An 
angel of the Lord appealed to Joseph in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Harry, Mary, as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. To a good boss, to a son, you're to give him the name Jesus. Because he will save the people from no sin. I love that tree. It goes with all the ancestors of baby Jesus. After all was told and hanging on the tree, I would stare with my mother in the dark of the living room with only the lights on the tree and admire all the people who came before Jesus, who point the way for the coming into the world. I like that Jesus had a family. I like that Jesus had a family tree. Me too. Now why don't we sing some Christmas carols? Okay. Okay.
sih Thank you for all the members of the Sunday School who produced this wonderful program today. Susan Barnhart and Jonas uh, Sterner. And uh, Donna, you probably had something to do with this and Amanda and Sharon and Mindy as well. I, I just know that's how it works. And thanks so much for our tech crew, uh, Gerald Shu and Adam Marsh. And I think Taylor and Ray Thacker are there. And thanks for all their good work. And let us now depart with the benediction. May Christ dwell in all your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge, that you may be filled with all fullness of God. Amen.
before we go, I wanted to share something with you. Sometimes we have something special to give to you, our congregation. Up here on this front corner pew, there's a box and there's a little journal in it, which is empty. And there's some pens, even more pens. And of course, if you haven't gotten a pen out from the front desk, you could get one there, or you could grab a pen or two or three out of the box here. There's plenty to share with others. But there's one journal book for each of you. And it says on the front, reach out with the love of Christ. And this could be for sermon notes. Bruce would love to hear that. Or it could be for prayer reminders, or it could be a prayer journal where you answer or write down answered prayers, or it could be daily reminders or little notes that you write and rip out and give to somebody else. Even if you're a visitor, or even if you're a lifetime member, or, or whoever you are, come down and grab one of these journals at some point today, and grab a pen or two or three and share a pen that has the information for our church on it. But most importantly, reach out with the love of Christ and remember that.